Mm. Well, yeah. that went well. How does that, how do you <laughs> feel, Gavin? That was like your first uh, interview conversation. And I, I, I loved, um, you know, the, the dialogue and, and yeah, the questions I, that you had I, prepared I, for Emil. And it just, um, I, it felt I, really good to just kind of get to I know the both of you a little bit better. It was great. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> I had so much fun. <laughs> oh man, this is great. Yeah. And I said to Gavin before you hopped on the call, Emil, that maybe uh, the stars will align and the two of you can meet in person one day. I think that'd, that'd be, be incredible, great. also. That would, would be great. That. That'd be great. <laughs>
there have been many studies about the fact that, you know, kids, all it takes is having one person that supports them for them to, to, to do, to do better, to survive, to not struggle with suicidal ideation, to, to be able to build self-esteem. And I think it's particularly difficult for queer and trans kids. You know, I, I think that there are lots of reasons why young people can struggle, whether it's because they have, um, whatever it is with their markers of identity if it's because they're living in poverty it's because they're disabled whatever it is it can be something that's very difficult growing up different um and and for lgbt kids i think it's especially hard if if they don't even feel comfortable like being honest about who they are and they don't have anyone at home or at school that can let them know that like who they are is perfectly normal is perfectly human is perfectly beautiful and 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 worthy of love so we're at a very interesting time i think there's definitely way more uh lgbtq plus bipoc representation across the board than i've ever experienced in my life so i'm really happy about that i think that we have to be um we still have to push to have kind of a broad spectrum of representation and not always be the sidekicks or the best friend. This is the color I want. This is Damien. He's almost too gay to function. Like we want to be the main characters, right? And tell very, very full stories. And I think within the spectrum of LGBTQ, there's so many nuanced, powerful stories. So I'm grateful when I see Billy Porter doing a trans youth story. You're transitioning so young. I just want to tell you how brave you are. It's not that brave if you're just being who you are. I'm, I'm excited to see um, Coleman Domingo playing Byron Rustin and you know, just all these, and all these young people who are coming out on TV and telling their stories, but we need more. We definitely need more. I think that is a great effort that people in that media are, are making to, to gain a, a space to show these uh, representations, this, this um, opportunity to show these issues that is at the end not issue at all. Spain have a lot of TV shows also, like Veneno, to show the struggle that people in the real life lives with their gender. I don't think all representation is good. It's a difficult thing to gauge, you know, because we're all often so desperate for it that we'll take what we can get. There's a whole documentary about, about this called Study Like Closet. The myth to be a gay man meant it. You not only did you wear pinch clothes and you had this kind of look on your face, but you carried a purse as well. It's the girls. I think the feeling is two women are together, then it's probably experimental and, or some kind of phase. And, you know, if the right guy came along, that would all change. It's the guys. You know, that's why people say, oh, I'm a, I'm a man. Like, being a man is based on who you have to be boning that day. Like, you know, if like Laverne Cox is like the gold standard of you know, queer and trans representation, someone like someone like her, um, or like the the cast in Pose, for example. When it comes specifically to trans youth in general, everybody could do something when it comes to that. There's a fight for everyone. And right now we are under a lot of hot fire. And the only way is to speak up. We need to rally around our people. We need our allies as much as possible. And also we need to get down there and show them that we're real human beings and that, you know, there, there doesn't need to be any kind of investigation when it comes to a child coming to their parent and letting them know who they are. Yeah. Well, if that's like the gold standard, right? And then there's stuff that's like really ho horrifying, you know, like Silence of the Lambs, you know, and how how that was like a, a sort of like bizarre, twisted trans character, right? So it's like, you know, it's a spectrum. I I, I would hate to like, you know, prevent people from putting out there like uh, and trying to make representation happen. And, you know, it's a hit or miss thing. Um, but yeah, not all of it is, is helpful. And I think anything that, you know, recycles, uh, just tropes and cliches and, and stereotypes is just never good. Like it's it's not only is it not good for the community, but it's also not even good like to consume. That that people glad assess, supervise the characters, the the, the the script in the media for TV shows, for example. But I think that um, that happens with all the 
minority communities. They're a prejudice that maybe can display in, in terms of, um, in a way, subreptitious way. You know, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, but I do think that this generation <laughs> is very inspiring. And so I'd love to know, you know, what people that are your age think about what what is missing in representation and how it's failing, you know? You know, there's more, there's definitely more cartoon characters that are LGBTQ, which is good because cartoons are like the easiest way to get through to kids. Not a lot of kids watch Henry Danger, but a lot of kids watch Encanto. So to see that representation everywhere is going to get it just normalized for kids so kids aren't afraid. So then stuff like the Don't Say Gay Bill doesn't happen in 50 odd years when these kids are all grown up and in Parliament. Speaking of uh, queer representation in animation, I love Steven Universe. And it was actually a kid who introduced Steven Universe to me. He was an 11 year old and and it was her favorite show. And I started watching it and I couldn't believe it. And the the way that the show progressed and ended in this really gorgeous, like transgender, for me anyway, it spoke to me as a transgender narrative. I mean, I was just obsessed. And um, even even in more mainstream things, like the, you know, the, the new Buzz Lightyear movie, the fact that like, it's just like a, regular part of the plot that it happens to be that his you know his best friend and partner happens to be a lesbian and she has this family you know and it's not it's not there's no big to do about it it's just a a part of the character i really like that i really appreciate that that's not something i ever thought i was going to get to see i didn't think i would get to see that in in growing up i mean it would be really cool to have a mainstream movie where the main character you know, is LGBTQ and it and it and in, in an in a blockbuster animated film and it and that it also is handled in that way that it's just like a part of who they are. I really like shows like that. I don't mention that it's gay or a part of the LGBTQ plus community or that there's something else going on that they just make it. Oh. Thing like in the Buzz Lightyear movie, um, where one of the main characters was. I never thought I would get to see that. Like growing up, I was like, we'll never see that. And I'm really grateful that your generation has more permission, has more freedom to kind of express yourselves. You know, we I didn't have that growing up. I'll be 55 this year and it's like, it was very different. You know, it's very kind of, you had to hold everything close and everything was like a secret. And um, so I think, you know, again, watching Gene Anthony rate on fame and also that he went to a performing arts school and all the other kids were like super creative and, and kind of living their dreams that all of that, it's like I could see myself fitting in. And that I think was hugely important for me. I think that every time uh, is more, more close for people to see in the media, the unnatural to see that kind of representations in the media because for me I I I speak about uh, the presentations the the diversity of the sexuality presentations there's nothing new about we can find in the beginning of the civilization these forms of live the sexuality and the identity also so now is uh, more visible for us so it's important that the media shows that but in the natural way not only in the mystery mystery way or like a weird ways or all oh, the strangers so they are the strange people the monstro you know paul preciado for instance the gay and lesbian movement or the lgbt movement even the transsexual movement uh the question would be like is our objective, our aim within these movements is to define and redefine identity and uh, make identity visible and construct identity, or maybe is to uh, invent new practices of freedom. And I think a lot of us queer folks have this. It's like being our most authentic selves, right? When it's a a little bit scary because we're breaking down barriers and we're crashing through ceilings and we're pushing back against the status quo. And sometimes that can be scary, but it's it's definitely worth it. But we also have to be concerned about our safety. It's always better. It's always better to be able to be honest about who you are as soon as possible. 
as soon as you can, because then you're more able to love yourself. You can't love yourself if you're not being honest about who you are. Then, then any love that you build is really false. It's, it's fraudulent. It's, it's, it's an artifice. You can't love yourself until you can accept yourself and be honest about who you are. And it took me a really long time. And frankly, if we'd had better representation in media, then maybe it wouldn't have. And maybe it wouldn't have taken me this long and maybe I could have learned to love myself sooner. Back and forth, just like a clock, love two hearts to share. Up and down in total shock to love's blind eyes compare. There again and back once more, hearts love will never fear. Love will travel through bolt lock door for this love is queer. The Oscar goes to... And the Oscar goes to... And the Oscar goes to... Alejandro G. Inarritu. Guillermo del Toro. Alfonso Cuero. In this documentary, we will focus on the cultural impact of the three amigos of Hollywood. Or in other words, Alfonso Cuaron, Guillermo del Toro, and Alejandro González Inarritu. These three are the first Hispanic directors to win major awards like the Oscars, Golden Globes, and many more. So together, we will learn about the start of these directors' careers and how they shaped the world of film into what it is today. This quote was said by Oscar-winning director Bong Joon-ho during his Golden Globes acceptance speech for his 2019 film, Parasite. While this documentary isn't about him, he brings a great point forward about foreign film. They bring so many new original stories and really open up a whole new world of film. That's why I think it's important for me to talk about these three directors because they show that with enough hard work and support of people around you, you can make a name for yourself no matter where you come from. While we all know now these directors and their accomplishments, let's learn more about their upbringing to see really where they started from in comparison to now. First, we're going to talk about Alfonso Cuaron. Cuaron was born in 1961 in Mexico City. When Cuaron first started his journey of becoming a filmmaker, he decided to attend Universario de Estudios de Cinematográficos. But that was short-lived, seeing that he was expelled from his school for creating a controversial project where he shot the entire thing in English instead of Spanish. Cuaron thought that was going to be the end of his career until he got the opportunity to work at a Mexican television studio as a technician. He made sure to work his way up in hopes of one day becoming a director. He had his directorial debut in 1991 with the release of Solo Con Tu Pareja. Over the years, he continued to build a name for himself and create projects and stories that he wanted to tell. Now we're going to talk about Alejandro González Inarito. Inarito was born in 1963 in Mexico City. Inarito didn't start off with the passion of becoming a director. In fact, he was kicked out of school when he was 16 years old and decided to become a transatlantic sailor. Being able to visit the entire world, see many places, different cultures, that is what inspired him to create stories and become a director. After that, he decided to get an education to better achieve his goals at the Universidad Empero Americana. He started off his career as a DJ at a Mexican radio station, but what made him different was the playlist that he made. Adrian's playlist told a story pieced together by different songs. Inaruto would then move on to work as a producer for a Mexican TV company, eventually starting his own in 1991 called Zeta Films. The company focused on making TV advertisements, but before becoming a full-time director, he focused on his first passion of music, going on to create six original scores. 
Inarito moved to the United States where he had his directorial debut for the film Amores Pelos. In retrospect of who he is today, it's rather crazy to think that his passion didn't lie within films. But looking at his life story and his inspirations, its compelling nature is a powerful lesson. Last, but certainly not least, we have Guillermo del Toro, born in 1964 in Guadalajara, Mexico. From a young age, del Toro always had an interest in the world of film. He started off making short films in high school and shortly after attended the University of Guadalajara where he studied filmmaking. His career began with special effects makeup where he co-founded the company Necropia in 1985. From there, he went on to work with several episodes as a director and writer of a Mexican show called Hora Marcada, which we will talk about later. After working on that show, he had his directorial debut with Kronos. Del Toro had a passion for filmmaking and kept working his way up until he got the chance to create the stories he always wanted to tell. The three directors today are best friends, but it took years of working with each other to reach this point. Remember that show I mentioned earlier, Hora Marcara? Well, that's where Cuaron first met Del Toro in the 1980s. Years later, Del Toro watched an early cut of one of Cuaron's films. He ended up calling him, telling him that he made a masterpiece, but it was 20 minutes too long. So Del Toro visited him and helped him edit down the film. The friendship only grew from there. Inarito met Cuaron through a mutual friend, Emmanuel Lubisky who has done camera work for both of their projects over the years. But their friendship has been long lasting because it's been built off their love for their film and their ability to be honest with each other on their projects. The films that these three alone have created will have a long lasting impact on fans all around the world. The films have iconic characters that fans love and stories that will keep people engaged. The stories are sometimes used as standards for films, seeing the complexity that goes into them, both film-wise and storytelling-wise. They all use inspiration from their lives and pour that into the films, which matches a quote by Inarito. Together, these three directors inspired so many filmmakers, including myself, and will continue to do so. The impact that just these three alone have for the film industry leaves a very optimistic view for diversity opening up in the film industry. For as long as I can remember, storytelling has been a major part of my life. My earliest memories go as far back as playing with my Legos, creating a mess around my whole room. While, sure, it looked like a mess to others, to me it was characters, a story, just a whole new world, a safe haven for me. That's why now as a filmmaker, I'm creating stories that I want to share with others. Not only of my stories, but stories that aren't heard before. To pursue my career as a filmmaker, I decided that I had to go back to my roots, and that's New York. So I packed my bags, left Miami, said goodbye to my friends and family, and took that next step not only for myself, but for my future. All filmmakers have one major thing in common. We all take things from our roots, cultures, and families. So if you ask any filmmaker about what inspired them, we would all say, we're just products of our communities. Right, so we're very excited to be some of the pioneers uh, to bring shipping container architecture for residential uses in Miami. Uh, so about a year ago, um, Creative Media Group drove by our house. They were very interested in the project. So um, they wanted to create a micro campus nearby here. So we're very excited to work with them and collaborate. I think it's important to mention that we see this as a great opportunity um, to participate in a project that here in Little Haiti and uh, working with a nonprofit organization and uh, um, being 
uh, able to create a sustainable environment. If you need to build fast, you can just put them on, on the side and, and build. Uh, but also, if you need to move them out, the same deal. You put it on a truck and then you move it out of the property. My name is Marcelo Ortortegui. And my name is Sara Valente. We are Stereotank. I was born and raised in Haiti, and the name of my project is um, Sous Globe 2.0, uh, or in English, um, Water Source 2.0. My name is Henry Rueda. I'm an architect. I am the chair of the Department of Architecture here at FIU. Part of the idea behind the sort of the goals of the, the educational um, sort of the, the vision that we have is also to work in multiple sort of topics: sustainability, the sort of environmental challenges that we have, especially in Miami, which is very dramatic; uh, community engagement, technology and innovation, and we have incredible facilities, and, and also sort of being or building a place here in the community of Miami and South Florida. So I know one thing more I've been asked for sure is like how are you going to power this up? Like, mm. you know, there is not really electricity and, uh, and jealousy or and handy really because, you know, everything is so timed out as far as electricity. So I thought, you know, two ways, um, wind turbines and solar and or solar panels. So that way they could, you know, um, it'll all happen on the roof um, mm -hmm. up here. Okay. Um, that's where the wind turbines and the solar panels will be placed, and that would power, you know, this whole building. Okay. Yeah. So that is the idea. Um, the infrastructural side of the project was really important because it was about water, but the community around was of special importance because we know the the role of awareness. Uh, at the moment is, uh, is crucial, right? So um, the project needed to have a series of components that were very important. And in the case of Matilda, she was able to create this hybrid. Architecture gives you a base, a framework that you can work from. So becoming an architect can, be, uh, can also mean becoming a social activist, can also mean becoming an artist can also mean uh, becoming an urban vision. My name is Sara Valente, and uh, I've been part of the adjunct faculty here at FIU since uh, 2017. So about Jalousy, I guess uh, it's a slump where about 60,000 people live there, and ever since the earthquake, more and more people started living there. And um, so as you can see here, so that's Jalousy, right? It's on, on the mountain. Yeah, it's a lot of Yeah, it's a um, <laughs> they feel like right on top of each other. And um, so the people there, you know, they do whatever they can to make a life for themselves. For each main distribution center, mm -hmm. which I call the community center, mm -hmm. right, it will be connected to substations. And okay. those substations are those remote the fountains. fountains. They're okay. smaller and more accessible to the people. Mm -hmm. And then, so for each of like, let's say for each 100 house, mm -hmm. there will be one uh, main distribution station with two substations, which are, which are the remote fountains. So, you see these radiuses, okay. so for each one of these, mm -hmm. that's where you have all of those okay. um, houses. Okay. 
happening. Mm -hmm. um, now, my main thing is one thing I was stressing about is the location mm -hmm. because Jalousy, like everything is already built, and it's not like I was able to go over there to check out to see okay. if I could find a plot of land that's empty. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's why, like, right now I'm just like, oh my gosh, I hope I'm not building on somebody's house, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the main success or what would be successful about this project would be the remote fountains because those, they're smaller mm -hmm. and you can place them and any, you know, 10 by, what was it, 10 by 20, um, like, My name is James Francois and I'm Matilda's father. <laughs> The time I realized when she was really good is when we, they had an exposure of, of her arts, what she did. And then when I saw all those things that she did, I said, mm -hmm. no, she's very special. And at that time, I was trying to have her play basketball because that was mm -hmm. one of my passions. So, okay, if I have a girl, okay, she's going to play basketball. But when I realized where she had and what she's doing, I said, mm -hmm. let me just let her follow a dream what she has to do. Creative Media Group has truly impacted my career and my life for the better. Maria and Tony are just some of the most generous, kind, supportive, and knowledgeable people I've crossed paths with in the industry and out. Uh, Maria is actually like my older sister now. She is my mentor in and out of the industry. I can go to her for anything, whether it's questions with life, networking, communication tools, just you name it and she's there for me. I feel like as I get older, I'm becoming more deliberate, more intentional, and purposeful. And with this new journey that I'm on, even though it's unpredictable and I don't know what the outcome is going to be, I really feel as though I'm being led. When we gave you that assignment, I saw pins flying. Ooh, I get to finally talk about what it is that I love to do, right? Because that's what this program is all about. How do we support what you guys love to do? How do we help you articulate what it is that you love to do? Because sometimes that's hard, too, as, as a creative or just as a person. To talk about yourself kind of seems a little challenging at times. That's why this round circle that we form, this circle of inclusion, is where we can kind of have this cipher to talk about what it is that we have going on. So. When I really felt like I was being called to something bigger than myself was when I was making our first set of t-shirts for our boys for the workshop that we were hosting with the foster youth. And as I was putting their names on their shirts, because that's something that I wanted to be intentional in, in naming them, naming the faces of the underrepresented community of young people and, and creatives. I felt like remembering somebody's name is important. So I'm um, putting the shirts together and, you know, putting their names on the shirts because I know the next day is when we're going to have to you know, get everybody together and organize um, the shoot. 
which is always a super exciting day because that's when our young people get to put their hands on the camera. And for some of them, that's the first time that they've ever handled a piece of equipment um, of an industry standard. You were cinematographer. No, I was a producer. You produced her cinematographer yeah, this time. Was, yeah. And it was a lot. I learned a lot from them, you know, making sure that the shots we choose are really meaningful and impactful. Um, keeping up with time, not being afraid to speak up and letting the other people, not the other people, the other team members know that we gotta go, we gotta go. It's been really cool and fun with them. And also yeah, this, this week we have been really working exciting. with them like, for a like, short film challenge. And it also has been really oh, great. We get a chance to use new equipments. And I figure out what was a dolly for the first time. <laughs> it was really cool, you know, we had got to use you know, new equipment, new camera, something red. As we started to host these workshops and experiences, that I, I really realized that the takeaway was not just the technical side of filmmaking, but the mentorship and the connectivity and the guidance that we were giving. But I really want to talk about how challenging it is to get that train in motion when you are alone by yourself um, fueling that momentum and gathering resources calling on your friends emailing people looking for um, support as um, a female business owner, as a female entrepreneur, and now as the founder of a nonprofit, it's super hard. <laughs> so thankful for you all, Jeffrey, Michelle, Vanessa, New York City, like we had a good time. Yes, yes we, we did. did. Yeah. 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 I'm thankful for the opportunities to be able to work in, in Miami, and work in New York, work with young creatives that are super talented. You know, my experience being a creative is majority of the time, I'm the only black girl on set. For me, that's a problem. That's a problem I felt was my duty to help change. There's power in storytelling. The fact that you can put a camera in a young person's hand and then that camera can open up opportunities for experiences, for relationships. I'm excited about presenting opportunities to young people. An opportunity to move outside of our box and claim our seat at the table.